Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us at Talks at Google. Uh, today's guest, I'm uh, very proud to uh, introduce uh, Alexis, don't call him Alex, Ohanian, uh, who has just published this book, which uh, you can all get here and you should all read. Uh, I had the, uh, the great opportunity to read it before it came out, uh, which, and I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I am surprised to see, however, that we don't believe in putting the title on the cover anymore. You know, so it's on the back. Who needs, who needs to go with convention? Without their permission. Uh, so uh, thanks very much, Alexis, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, So, uh, not to give away too much of the book, but I just wanted to start by asking you a little bit about a story that happens early in the book that I really enjoyed, uh -huh. which is apparently when you were a teenager, you started out in a CompUSA pitching software demos to basically an empty store for yeah. hours at a time. Yeah. So tell Great me job. a little bit about that and how you think it might have actually surprisingly prepared you for what came after. Well, uh, so I was, a, I was a teenager when a buddy of mine, Jacob, uh, shout out Jacob Winthrop, was like, hey dude, one of my childhood friends, you want a job demoing software at a CompUSA? And I was like, sure, I don't know what that entails, but it's gonna pay me like $10 an hour. And I was like, hell yes. So I show up and uh, on my first day, he puts me in this little booth. Actually, you guys remember what a CompUSA is? Like, there are probably a lot of you who have no idea. Um, it was this amazing store where you could go and buy all your computer related needs. And they put me in a little booth. And it was this company called Cydea, uh, which was uh, one of the many corpses from the first tech boom. But at the time, they were paying us this absurd amount of money, $10 an hour, to basically every 30 minutes do the same pitch, the same like 10 minute pitch of whatever software or hardware we had at the time. So it would be like, look at this amazing mouse. It is a great mouse. Or I remember we played this one, there was a Madeleine, uh, math, I think it was a game, it was one of those was sort of point and click adventure games for kids. And I must have played, I, I practically learned French at the end of those two months because we'd be playing the same thing over and over again. But all that's to say, for, uh, for like a chubby teenager to get up in front of an audience every 30 minutes and literally have the worst experience in a public speaker could have, which is everyone ignoring you. It's like worse, worse than time. being a stand-up comic. The worst, right, because <laughs> you, you were basically annoying people who are just trying to shop and they're always looking over like, God, really, you just did this 30 minutes ago. Like, you, you were like the pre-internet version of spam. I was a really. spammer, yeah. I, was, I mean, I, I would say a step, uh, just a step probably below the dudes who are always handing out flyers on New York uh, street corners, right? And I had my little megaphone and my headset and just demoed software, but it was, and you actually put this very well as we were talking, it, I guess it was kind of like my 10,000 hours moment with public speaking, and it was a great way, I mean, it's all practice, look, anyone, anyone you see up there who's like an amazing public speaker, even a good public speaker, they don't, they aren't born that way, they just spend a lot of time doing it. Uh, and it's shocking how terrified people are of it but you all need jobs at doomed companies to just get over it uh, for a couple now, of years. Now, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't have to you're not You're not making any predictions about Google there, I, I don't think you guys have to worry too much uh, about Google. You guys actually, they wouldn't, you, you wouldn't show me the room, but there is a room that literally prints money here. Uh, I'm not allowed to see it. I'm not allowed to see it, but I know that, yeah. That's a Google, that's a Google X thing. We don't I talk see. about that. All right. Uh, so uh, speaking of companies that were not doomed, yes. uh, another big section of the book is about about Reddit, uh, yeah. which of course you were one of the founders of. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really striking to me in reading the book, you tell the story, and of course you tell the story about how your Y Combinator uh, experience was really pivotal to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, the Y Combinator connection comes back in almost every chapter of the book that follows. Um, yeah. I'm sort of curious, one, what do you, what do you think about that community and, and its value, not just to your company, but to the startup scene in general? And then maybe a harder question, if that pitch at Y Combinator had not worked out, what do you think would have happened? Wow, okay, well, so first and foremost, you know, we, so Steve and I, I gotta give you the full thing, like Steve and I were seniors at UVA, and I had talked to him, I, I had a, basically I had an epiphany at a Waffle House, realized I didn't wanna be a lawyer, sorry, I just, <laughs> I didn't. Good. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thankfully, I realized I wanted to just live like a college student working on fun projects. And I had this friend of mine, Steve, who was a talented engineer. We had talked about stuff for long enough. Anyway, I convinced him to work on a company with me called My Mobile Menu, or Mmm. 
That was the <laughs> that was the name for it. Which I don't I, I can never tell if that's a good response, like great idea, or that was a stupid name. But anyway. <laughs> I convinced him to do this instead of taking a job at a software company. And you know, during our senior year, his girlfriend saw an article somewhere on the interwebs about a guy named Paul Graham giving a talk called How to Start a Startup, and it was up in Boston. And it was during our senior year spring break. So of course, we went to Boston instead of going to a beach, because laptops suck on beaches. There's not a lot to do there, a lot of screen glare. It's just not fun. And we heard him Sam, give this talk. Terrible. It's not, there's no, there's rarely Wi-Fi. It's, just, <laughs> it's not fun. And, uh, and we heard Paul give this talk, and, and it, it, we, we, we lucked out. We, Steve approached him afterward to get an autograph, and I followed and said it'd totally be worth the cost of buying you a drink to pitch you on our idea. We came from Virginia, like, hear us out. And, uh, and he was shocked, shocked that I guess we came all the way from Virginia to Boston and, and said okay. And one thing leads to another. A few weeks later, he announces Y Combinator. He'd given us really good feedback on mmm. And, uh, and we applied and had a great interview and then got rejected. Uh, and then got drunk, and the next morning he called it's back. Good, it's good that it went in that order. Right, we, we probably, that, we would have known the exact reason why we got rejected, right, if we had just gotten drunk first. It would have made the interview more fun, but we, 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 it, it hurt, it hurt, and, uh, and they called us back the next morning and said, we don't like your idea, it's too early. 2005, right, the smartest phone on the market was a Trio. Uh, with a stylus, remember those things? And like Blackberry was still a company. And <laughs> I guess Palm was still a company too, but anyway. It, what, no love for Newton? It was too Come early. Oh, <laughs> another, another wonderful product. But like, it was ahead of its time. Um, we, and and we, we lucked out because he, he calls up and I, I'm like, hello, and Paul says, listen, we'll let you do Y Combinator, just come up with a new idea. Do something on the web, mobile's too early. So we come back up there, we speak with Paul for an hour, and he asks us what our problems are every morning, and we say you know, a bunch of things, including how to find out what's going on in the world. And Steve had loved Slashdot for many years. I was just reading a bunch of news uh, sites in my browser every morning, and, and that, that became what would become Reddit. And, uh, and so all that's to say, Y Combinator changed our lives. Um, we even, you know, even after the success we had with Reddit, for Steve and Adam and, and me to some extent, it was a no-brainer to do Y Combinator again with Hitmonk. And look, that's not to say there's obviously, there, everyone knows about the sort of Y Combinator mafia and that network. We don't do anything illegal, but it's that very <laughs> strong network among founders. Um, if nothing else, I think it is great because it has helped people, it has helped people really appreciate how, I mean, they, they were the first ones to really show if you invest less money than it costs to get a Ford Focus, you can have a billion dollar company within a few years. And, and really, I mean, look, no matter how you feel about Y Combinator, they are, I think part of the reason it's been so special is they genuinely care about founders doing right by their founders. And I think that more broadly helps the greater ecosystem because now people can't, uh, investors can't get away with being jerks in the way that they used to even 10 years ago. It's, it's, that founder friendliness has a ripple effect. Um, and so, yes, it's obviously, it's influenced me. I'm, I'm very appreciative because it's made me who I am. And you know, the reality is if we hadn't gotten that call back we would have gone back to Virginia and tried to prove Paul and Jessica wrong. We would have showed them, mmm, is gonna take over the world. We probably would have stayed in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is a great college town, but not the biggest market. And I, I, we probably would have languished for a few years trying to figure out what was gonna happen. Maybe we would have gotten lucky with the App Store finally coming online, or I, who knows. But. All, all I know is all the college kids in, in, at UVA, yeah. they could have had a great mobile ordering <laughs> service, and you, you just, yeah. Yeah, it's we very disappointing. Them. We have very disappointing. Them. Very but disappointing. But what's what, it, what is so cool now is there are so many companies that are doing this, and, and it's, someone's going to win the day, and then we'll never have to wait in line for a frappuccino. So there's that. <laughs> so one other thing that comes through to me as I'm reading the book about obviously you start you know Reddit, and then you guys go on and do Hipmunk, and you've done a whole bunch of other great startup related ideas and supported a lot of other startups. Um, you're not a technical person, mm -hmm. um, sort of by your own admission in the book. You were not the the uh, coding chops behind Reddit, uh, oh, and I'll you see. haven't been the coding chops behind any of these other <laughs> startups that you've. So I, I'm sort of curious, as you know, a lot of the people in this room don't have that handicap. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Yeah, uh, but for those of us uh, like myself, you know, I was a liberal arts major undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sort of curious, what are your thoughts about is being a technical person more and more necessary, less and less necessary? Is it orthogonal to the whole question of being in a startup? What I'm really curious about your perspective in a world full of sort of hardcore coders not being one. 
You know, the running joke in that first batch of Y Combinator, and this was back when it was in Boston, all right, but it was at maybe a dozen or so companies, uh, was what does Alexis do? And they'd always have to, they'd always ask this about Steven. At some point, I, it was clear they weren't joking, they were genuinely concerned. <laughs> because I think I was the only non technical person in YC, maybe with one exception. But, but it was, and obviously, YC is very biased, this whole tech industry for startups, it's so biased towards technical founders, which is why it's so important to be able to write code, because if you have an idea, congratulations, you are one of everyone. <laughs> everyone has great ideas. Um, so it is, it is more important than ever. And, and you know, I, if I could do it all over again, I was, I was, in, I don't want to brag, uh, but in Howard High School, I was the best in my Pascal class. Uh, I, I, I loved, I loved programming. And, and, and you knew how to pitch software in 10 minute chunks. I knew how to pitch, that's, so that's I had good. that going for me. But I, and I, you know, I was very proud of my mascot doodles as well. But at the end of the day, if I could do it all over again, I would have stuck with, I would have stuck with computer science when I got to college. What happened was I met Steve freshman year. He just lived across the hall from me. And I was so excited because he was another geek. He was playing video games. We were talking about the gaming PCs we had built. And at some point, you know, he's like, oh, I'm in the engineering school. I do CS. And I was like, oh, I think I'm going to be pre-med or something. That lasted a week. I ended up being a history major. And, <laughs> and, and it was clear. He was someone, you know, it's good, we, we, and, I, and I, I feel guilty saying this, but it was clear he was the kind of person who, we all have, uh, imagine that, like, when, when a talented or fairly talented high school athlete goes to college and meets someone who's very clearly, you, you just know she's going to be in the Olympics one day, and you think, well, I'm probably going to ride the pine and have to figure out something else to do. I felt that way when I met Steve. Here was someone who was clearly just a, just a brilliant technical mind he was going to go off to do things, and I was intimidated he, by he it. He ruined it for you. You were yeah. like, I'm not, I was I'm not going to do it. that. And, and you know, the first version of Reddit was in Lisp, too. And he spent a sad 48 hours trying to work with me, learning. I was trying to learn Lisp for about 48 hours. It did not. I still have that. I have, I have a photo of that journal entry where I just said, this hurts, dot, dot, dot. Uh, it, it was, that was, yeah. That was not fun. A lot. I still can't look at a parenthesis without like shaking a little to this day. I think you're selling yourself a little bit short but because I'm, I think a lot of what you talk about in the book is the importance of figuring out what users want and really paying attention, being there, listening to their complaints, answering them. Uh, and you know, the truth of the matter is, I'm guessing Scott probably didn't have the time to do as much of that as you did. Oh no, no so. yeah, Steve was busy actually building the site. Steve, right? Sorry. And and I, you know. Yes, and that is what, so what do I tell non-technical founders today? One, learn how to code. You can, you can get started right. The tutorials that are available today versus even eight years ago when we started Reddit are uh, orders of magnitude better. But if you do manage to convince a technical co-founder to work with you, be egoless, be willing to do anything, whether it's ordering the takeout, dealing with the lawyers, negotiating the cell phone bill, like do everything else. Create and, and, and care so much, especially early on, about those few users who are actually willing to try your new service that no one has ever heard of that has a weird typo and care so much about them because those people are crazy. Those people are amazing and wonderful and, and like those are the ones who are gonna be those early adopters and those evangelists. That's how, I mean, that's how we built the audience at Reddit. That's how we did it at Hipmunk. That's how I see non-technical founders doing it all the time. Uh, but really, I mean, I, I'm preaching the choir here, but developing, writing code is the most valuable skill of this century. And uh, like I said, if I could do it all over again, I would. So in the book, after the acquisition of Reddit, mm -hmm. um, you did a whole bunch of really interesting things uh, that were not just about making the next million dollars mm -hmm. or whatnot. So mm -hmm. I, I say a little bit about that and about what, it struck me that a lot of the stuff you did were much more civic-minded than I think I'm used to seeing, you know, usually men who cash out from startups, uh, I don't see them doing the kinds of things you did. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what put you on that path? Uh, oh, wow. I have to, I, mm, I should probably give all the credit to my mom. I, I don't know. I mean, it, I, think, I think when you have the fortune that I had of being a 23-year-old you know, millionaire, right, you could go one of two ways. Um, it, at the end of the day, though, what anchored me so much was having the relationship that I had with both of my parents, but especially my mom, um, that made me appreciate what really mattered in life. Uh, and I won't, I won't go into too much detail because it usually makes me sad and cry. So instead, um, what I will say abstractly is you know, most 22, 23 year olds, whatever, don't have they don't have the, the wisdom that usually comes with age when you actually start questioning your mortality and wondering what's going to happen and what you'll care about when you're on your deathbed. 
uh, as a 23 year old, I knew very, very well what people cared about when they were facing death. And that was not, that was something I wish I could, trust me, I wish I could have not had that happen. But the advantage was it gave me a perspective that I think usually we aren't fortunate enough, I suppose is the word, to get until much later. So all that's to say, um, it was easy because I knew that there were not going to be, I never wanted to have things that made me happy. I wanted to have experiences and actions and a legacy that made me happy. And, and I look, I think all altruism is selfish. Don't get me wrong. Uh, there's, it, 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 I, I, there is no, I'm not a monk here. Uh, it is just, it is an opportunity for us who have done so well uh, to make sure other people can too. And look, I mean, I, I also say this, you, you, you correctly identified my gender. Um, but it is also, you know, as a straight white dude, um, the way I like to describe it is it's kind of like uh, uh, playing on easy mode. I played a lot of video games too, um, and that <laughs> no, doesn't. Really? <laughs> that's not obvious, um, and and it doesn't in any way. I don't think it in any way takes away from success that I am proud of that I feel like I have earned. But it's an admission of the fact that it is just a little easier for things that are not of my control. Like it just it's the way the world is, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it makes me, I don't know, it makes me really aware of the asterisk. It, this isn't like a Barry Bonds kind of asterisk. Um, <laughs> but it is an asterisk that, that points out that, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I had advantages other people don't have. And uh, if I really believe in the power of the internet, it's for anyone with a great idea to be awesome. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. That's why I'm going on a crazy 150 stop bus tour. Yeah, actually, I was going to just ask, yeah. you know, say a little bit about that bus tour, because I thought that was uh, for an industry and for, you know, if you read the tech press, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I would love to do a, uh, a study of every company mentioned on TechCrunch mapped. Uh, and I would, it would be very interesting to see if there was anything between the, the West Coast and the East Coast that is ever mentioned on TechCrunch, or I don't mean, don't mean to single them out. It's true, I think, of all the tech press. Yeah. So I mean, what, what, oh, man. what made you think, let's go across the country in a bus? Well, um, so I think you're absolutely right. And you're talking to a guy, mind you, Reddit was not once covered in TechCrunch until the day we got acquired. We were the, I mean, we were based out of Medford, Mass or Somerville, Massachusetts. We're still in a startup hub, but there is very much most of the tech press you know, stays to the Bay, New York, Boston, uh, the coasts. And last year, this pissed me off because I kept hearing Silicon Valley, no offense, guys, defeated Hollywood in the battle against Soap and Pippa. And it's like, yeah, OK, you, you're, we all showed up. But this is the whole country showed up, millions whole of people. World. The whole world, right? Yeah. And, and so I wanted to illustrate this as best I could. And instead of just talking about it, we crowdfunded a bus and drove it through the heartland for 10 days. We visited Google Fiber in Kansas City and took a number of other stops and met with farmers and truckers and startup founders and students and all kinds of people who were using the internet to be awesome, whether it was starting companies, running their family farms better, all that to really just show off that it wasn't just Silicon Valley. The internet economy is not just a few zip codes here in California, it's the entire world. And at least for our politicians' consideration, it is the entire United States. Every one of their constituents lives in like a digital district. Uh, and, and so I thought, all right, that was fun. That was my beta test. Now let's do it for five months and go to 75 universities. Um, because I basically want to deliver, I want to deliver the class or the talk that I wish I had had while Steve and I were at UVA. We, we lucked out, right? We, we heard ba Paul Graham was giving a talk in Boston, up at Harvard. We got up there, but I want to deliver it. Let's, uh, let's go to, I'm excited because we're going to go to Ohio State. Arizona State, all right? I don't know how many Arizona State alums are in the crowd right now. Represent, all right? <laughs> so Arizona State has a reputation of being a school that has a very good time. Would that be accurate? <laughs> when, we announced, when we announced the tour, and we had all the obvious schools, and, we had, we, and I wanted to make sure we hit a number of large schools, not just the Ivies. I, mean, I, went to, I went to UVA, I went to a public school, but like still, not just the obvious candidates. Arizona State, the, I don't know what they did, but they came out in droves. There was a deluge of emails and tweets from people at Arizona State, undergrads and grads they today. Heard, they heard about, mmm, and they were like, <laughs> we need more of that. They, maybe, I hope so. <laughs> they, at the very least, at the very least, they just, they were, they were pissed off because they care about this stuff. They want that spirit of internet entrepreneurship because it's already, it is there in pockets, but they want someone to come in and really be like, yes, there's no reason why you can't do this too. And, and it was great. Like that's, I, I, and I have to admit, even I was a little surprised at first. Then I was like, shut up, Alexis, stop being surprised. Like this is, if the thesis is true, 
this is not just something that kids at Stanford care about. And obviously, it's easy to just cherry pick and be like, every kid Stanford wants to start her own startup one day. And okay, that's probably true, actually. Uh, <laughs> but more power to them. Um, but this is a nationwide, this is a worldwide phenomenon. And, and it's not just starting companies. It's just, you know, it's getting your first film funded on Kickstarter. It's opening your first Etsy store. It, it's using these platforms, even if you're not building them. And have you uh, taken that message uh, out to other countries as well. I imagine this is a yeah. message that a lot of people are ready to hear. Yes, um, and I've and it's been funny uh, because of interesting. We haven't. I, I don't know how exactly the the, the world works with uh, publishing and licensing internationally. There have been a number of people abroad who have had trouble getting the book because it's not technically published there yet, even in digital form, which is kind of a mind job, right? So they've found ways to acquire the book on the internet. Uh, using things, um, which is great. I'm happy the idea is spread, uh, and and there has been an uh, there there has been a ton of requests to go abroad. But I'll tell you, I feel like I learn more from those things than I could possibly present. Uh, one of the one of the stories that had such a big impact on me was going to Egypt just a few weeks after Mub it was maybe a month or so after Mubarak fell, and it was a tech entrepreneurship conference. And here I am in Cairo talking to a few dozen entrepreneurs who are literally revolutionaries. Right? Like they call founders like me and, and, and David Karp and Larry and Sergey revolutionaries. I mean, that's bullshit. No offense to those guys, but like we're not revolutionaries, right? That's a great hyperbole to throw on a magazine, but like these were people who were actually, <laughs> actually trying to forge a new Egypt and in the process were also starting companies and had the same ambitions. They asked the same, same damn questions you get asked in Brooklyn from a bunch of tech founders. It's, it's obviously very different starting a company in Egypt versus here um, for, for Lots of sort of macro reasons, but at a micro level, they're trying to—they're just trying to make something people want, just the same. And to see that same kind of hustle is just—it's so inspirational. Because like I, you know, I realize uh, I realize the life lottery ticket that comes just from being born in the states versus being born anywhere else, and how easy it is to just open a laptop and get started on a business. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think it's a good time to get to the politics part of our program right. today. Right. Obviously, a chapter of your book is about the SOPA PIPA fight that you played and, and Redditors. And Google. Uh, and, Thank you, Google. Well, <laughs> we did our part, and, uh, and Wikipedia and all kinds of other folks uh, participated in. Uh, I'm sort of curious, what, what got you interested? What made it possible for when that happened for you to sort of say, hey, yeah, this is something I want to try to do something about? Yeah. Uh, and do you think there are any real lessons that you want to impart to people about what, what you learned and what the internet hopefully learned? Oh, yes. So I fell into this. I had not been terribly politically active before this. I mean, I voted, but I was not in, by any means an activist or any, anyway really that passionate about it. Um, and then I got an email from a friend of mine, Christina Shi, and she said, hey, some friends of mine are working on this thing called Fight for the Future, and they're really worried about these two bills, SOPA and PIPA, and they may actually become law. And I took a look, and I'm reading through it, and I'm like, no, no, this is so stupid. There is no way this could actually become. And I start emailing, and I realize very quickly uh, that no, actually, these bills are considered to be inevitable. That was the inevitable in Washington. They had they Democrats, were, they, they had wired. Republicans. It was they done. Were, it was like the, the check was chamber, signed. The Chamber of Commerce and the unions agreed, and the, they were like, "Well, that never happens." Yeah, so, right. Yeah. Let's take advantage. Right. This would be at a time when, even back then, I know it's hard to believe, government was seeming dysfunctional. Uh, <laughs> I know. Right? Back then, good thing Compared we got to that solved. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's all. But <laughs> this was something that was ostensibly bipartisan. It was. I mean, they had Democrats and Republicans lining up. Hollywood had, the entertainment industry had dropped about 94 million in lobbying. It was all finished, all gonna happen. And, and it was clear, you know, at the time I was just transitioning out of Hitmonk, and it was clear I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't participate because Steve and I never would have been able to start Reddit if either of those bills were law. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I would have loved if my peers at, you know, Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else were also joining in, but it's fine. It's fine. We were there. Yes, I know. No, I know. Well, dude, between Google and then the Wikipedia blackout was the big one because big that deal. made it. I, I was ignored by my even my friends who were producers in the media up until Wikipedia went dark because then, you know, top 10 website. Actually, I remember checking Wikipedia at like five minutes past midnight and I was pissed off because it was down. And I was like, oh, no, wait. Right. Good cause. This is a good cause. <laughs> and, and I felt that rage for me. I was like, what's happening? All oh, right. 
Um, <laughs> but it was after that that all of a sudden the phone starts ringing and I spend 24 hours pretty much on TV explaining why the internet's enraged. But like, all of this is to say, I, 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 I got a, like I said, I got a fortuitous email. I was down in DC a week later and I started meeting with senators and reps and their staffers and what was so wild was they were actually listening to me. The ones, the ones we met with at least, this is, a very, this is a small sample, but they were actually listening. We would go around the table, we'd have our three minute elevator pitch for saving the internet. And I just told my story of Reddit and how Steve and I were able to get this thing started out of an apartment for 12 grand and now look what it's doing. And that story of the American dream um, that economic story was enough to get people to perk up their ears because look, sad as it is, the thing that actually moves them is the potential of being accountable for losing jobs. Jobs, economic jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. I mean, I, had, I actually went on the technology subreddit the night before and asked for advice. And I said, well, what, should I talk about censorship? Should I talk about the economic repercussions? And it was great, I was getting talking points from the internet and <clears throat> everyone what, was saying. What could possibly go wrong? Well, <laughs> touche. We were, I, I lucked out because there was the, the ratio of cats to good advice was actually, it was pretty good, not too many cats. But they all said, don't even bother with censorship. And, and it was just, I don't know if it was just cynicism, there were a few people who claimed to be staffers or former staffers, they don't even bother, no one cares. Talk about the jobs, 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 jobs. Mention jobs every two seconds, jobs. You mentioned, and, you mentioned in, the, in the book that, uh, exactly, jobs. <laughs> the, uh, the protest in New York that you yes. attended in person, the fact that one of the things you said, I mean, there's a whole bunch of pr people who came out yeah, about in IRL yeah. to protest against this, and you, a you asked, I mean, mostly techies, I assume, and you asked them, how many of you work at companies that are hiring? Yeah, uh, I thought hand. that was I thought that was great, very powerful, uh, and that's exactly what people in DC can hear, for better or for worse. And that was, that message resonated and we saw, we saw a bill that went from unthinkable, or sorry, went from inevitable to unthinkable. Almost, almost overnight after the blackout on the 18th, you saw people running, yeah. running, because a bunch of citizens picked up a phone, called up, a bunch of citizens signed petitions, a bunch of, I mean, a bunch of citizens actually got engaged and millions of disparate people. This was a leaderful movement, right? It wasn't just a couple of people pulling strings. Like yeah. this was a decentralized, very internet kind of story. And it worked, yeah. it actually worked. It did something that everyone in DC said was not possible. And it right. defeated an entrenched lobbying group that has spent their entire industry basically trying to buy Washington to write laws to preserve their outdated business models. I'm a little biased. <laughs> but, but we actually won. And so for me, as a, as a kind of political virgin, that was so dangerous because it inspired me so much because I was like, holy shit, like yeah. the system's broken 99% of the time, but look, it actually worked. Yeah. And it was thanks to the internet that we were able to connect and amass this. I was, um, I was really struck as, as part of that fight. It, it's, as people talk about it in retrospect now, there is almost a sense of magic about, and then there was a blackout and then the law was defeated. Um, but there's been a lot of great stuff being written about the actually what happened. And one of the things that I think uh, people shouldn't forget is Tumblr. Yes. Um, Tumblr, early on, early on they issue. did a, a, an interesting, they blacked out pieces of their website, and then they created basically hacking together existing web tools. They hacked together an, a web to phone interface that led straight to the congressional switchboard of your member of Congress. Yep. And, I thought that was just such a great concrete example of it's not magic, it's existing web tools, bringing the technologies of the web and just tying stuff together to make things happen. Uh, and you know, Tumblr wasn't the end of the story, but I think it was a very important beginning to the story. Oh yeah. Uh, and that, that led to the Wikipedia blackout and Google's, you know, partial blackout and all that. So the the the, the impressive thing and the thing that I hope to impart on as many people as possible is that we all have a responsibility and I think, you know, just as citizens, it is so easy to get so cynical. <laughs> it is so easy to get so disappointed and frustrated, but we have- Again, again, this week in particular. <laughs> Look, trust me, I'm just like face palming most of the time whenever I get updates about what's going on in Washington. It is still, our government. It is still a government by the people for the people. And the internet presents, it is just a tool, but it presents a tool that can be used to let us actually get the leverage and, and, and input that we deserve, that we've always deserved, that we always should have had. And, and so that part of that is just being, I mean, I, I go around demoing the Contact Congress app on my smartphone. 
just because I like the accessibility. I, I've been calling my rep staff uh, the last couple of weeks just to check in. Like, I like the accessibility of knowing that I can Go push a button. Government's gonna go back online. Just be like, hey, what's <laughs> happening? Like, what's going? Like, the we should feel that same kind of accountability because so much of the inane stuff. You know, we, I, I can see the photo of some stranger's breakfast right now, right, on Instagram or what have you. Like, that's, that's great. I'm happy that exists. I'm not going to hate on it. I like looking at food. But if we get that kind of transparency and insight into random things about random strangers, shouldn't we have that kind of insight into our government, into the people who represent us? So this was the thing that really struck me reading your book and, frankly, even after the Sopa Pippa fight. It's, I agree with you completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that kind of transparency is absolutely crucial. But another piece of it, frankly, is the money piece. Yes. Uh, and Huge I wondered, I've wondered for a long time, why is there no Kickstarter for politics? Why have we, we've taken the tools of transparency, we've taken the tools of you know, phone calls and all of that, but we haven't mm -hmm. democratized the tools of giving money to politicians when they do things we like. Yeah. Because that's, you know, Positive reinforcement that can be effective. So uh, that's always sort of struck me. What's the? Why haven't we crowdfunded the government we want to see? I don't think we've had candidates yet that have really been able to have the savvy or the gusto Let's or the. Let's crowdfund what? them. I, I mean, I, right? Like maybe there. I mean, there are. What, look, what are you doing next uh, next fall? You we can. Uh... <laughs> well, Google, I wanted to come here to announce <laughs> that next fall I am running for nothing. I, <laughs> I, here's the thing, we're gonna get a candidate, right? And, and, and because she's a technologist, she's gonna instinctively understand how valuable this is. And with that, we're gonna see, you're right, technologically, right? I'm mean, gonna go down the list, okay? We already have solved problem is crowdfunding, right? We have, this is a solved problem, right? We could do this tomorrow. We could do this in Hackathon over the next 24 hours. Um, one of my favorite examples of a Google Doc, yeah, shameless plug in action, is the nonprofit watsi.org which manages every single financial transaction on that nonprofit in a public, real-time, of course, Google Doc. So at any moment, you can go to this nonprofit's website and check up on their finances, every transaction. That kind of transparency is solved. That's done. They're doing it right now. And they're an example that's probably going to affect every nonprofit going forward, because why else would I want to give to a nonprofit that doesn't give me that kind of accountability? Watsi can do it. Why can't you? We get someone running for office crowdfunding, actually publicly sharing every dime of where money gets spent, where it comes in. That data is already public. It just comes out too late in real time. And all of a sudden, now we have a representative or a senator who we can point at and say, all right, she did it. Why the hell can't you? And, and have that example as a very real concrete example. And all this, all, this off, all this software is pretty much off the shelf. Like it's, I, look, I, I'm going to spend the next five months on a bus just talking to college students. Uh, <laughs> but I hope, I hope it inspires some who are at least, I guess they'd have to be old enough to run. Well, they can do it at the local level. The point is, it is going to happen. And when it does, I can't help but feel like they're going to have such an amazing amount of support from all of those people who called up to fight against Soviet people, all those people who care about the internet. The internet public is just about everyone. And it's about time we actually could flex some some muscle uh, because that's I mean that's, this is what we deserve. So uh, it I I totally agree with all of that, and I, I look forward to seeing this. that. We should, run, we should was, find this candidate uh, 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 runner. Oh, well, well, it's, uh, it's a great idea. Yeah. It's a great idea. Take it, please. Someone do it. But let me just say I think it's sort of funny. I mean, we in Silicon Valley work at Google. You mm -hmm. read Reddit. It you forget that outside of this bubble, the internet actually has a very different uh, reputation, mm -hmm. if you will. And yeah. I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, so much of the press about the internet is dominated by the bad guys, mm -hmm. whether it's the malware people or, you know, revenge porn or, you know, there's, there's, it's like every media cycle finds some tiny corner of the internet to say that this is what the internet is. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Reddit, you know, you, you probably have more than uh, a fair amount of, rep, of uh, experience with this problem. Yeah. So I'm sort of curious, what are your thoughts? Is this a, a PR problem? Is this a real problem? Is there, you know, what if anything should the internet do about it or not do about it? Okay, well, so the internet, when we talk about the internet, I, when I, all right, in this instance, when I describe the internet, I'm talking about this technology. This, the internet is a reflection, like any other tool, of the people who use it. Whether it's a hammer, whether it's a printing press, whether it's a thing. 
And wh whether it was the five o'clock news 30 years ago, bleeds and leads, like yeah. we, we have a tendency to talk about this stuff because mundane things never make headlines, right? Joe is a reasonable person one day. Jane is a reasonable person the next day. That doesn't, that doesn't get attention in the way that the extremes do. Um, that's not to say it's not a problem. Uh, it is just that, like all things, the stuff that is basically the, the, uh, the statistical minority, but that is doing offensive, awful, whatever stuff, is the thing that gets the spotlight, that gets the attention. And then, unfortunately, then I worry, it, then it gets the, the laws, right? It's sort of that's what, what leads the news becomes the thing the member of Congress wants to introduce a law about, and often... I was just reading a blog by a law professor here in Santa Clara, Eric Goldman, who's great, and he had a great line this morning. He said, I have never seen any law passed by any state about the internet that has been anything other than terrible. Uh, uh, yeah. And so I wonder, you know, is it, it, what, as long as that's the mechanism, you know, you see these uh, you know, extreme stories and then that's what yields policymaker attention, mm -hmm. uh, we have this kind of, you know, I wonder if this is going to be the next thing the cat signal gets used for. And I, I guess that, that's sort of my next question. Like, what, where do you think the next internet cat signal worthy threat to the open internet comes from? Okay, probably, well, I mean, so Verizon's at it again with net neutrality stuff, or at least thwarting it. Um, there's TPP, and I don't think any of us have a clue what's going on there because it's all closed doors, world leaders not telling us jack. That's copy treaty. It will include some copyright law provisions that will yeah. uh, involve a number of different countries that are negotiating it in secret. Totally in secret. Um, copyright reform seems like it's on the table. That could be great. I'm I will, hoping it's I will say this about copyright yeah. reform. I, that committee of Congress, yeah. they have not forgotten Pippa and so Oh, good. They, they are still they're quite, uh, they're paying close attention. Yeah, so, excellent. Uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's pretty good, all things considered. Well, I hope, I mean, the, the hope there is we can actually start, we can actually roll back copyright to stop protecting Mickey Mouse and actually start helping people innovate and be creative. Like the whole, it's, yeah. it's scary. And I, I was able to dig up some old stuff from, because uh, I went to UVA, of course, I love quoting TJ. And I found some old letters of his where he even debated putting a limit, an explicit limit in the Constitution for sort of personal monopolies for, for yeah. copyrights and trademarks. Where it would just, because there is a short term reason and a great reason to have copyright, but the way it has been abused has taken it so far from its intended purpose that it's actually stifling innovation when it's supposed to you know, encourage it and enable it. Um, so hopefully, I think that's, that's probably the next one where there's gonna be some meeting, something coming up, and it's gonna be on us to rally as many artists, as many musicians, as many authors, as many creatives, copyright makers as possible to say, no, 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 hold on. Actually, uh, you know, the reason uh, my buddy, um, oh my gosh, I can only think of Dinosaur Comics right now. Um, the reason that Ryan North, who creates Dinosaur Comics, was able to remix Hamlet into a Choose Your Own Adventure version of Hamlet and raise $600,000 on Kickstarter was because it's in the public domain. You know, I don't think the estate of Shakespeare loses because, anything. Because Disney has not yet Disney's made their animated, animated Hamlet version. I know, <laughs> and it's like, we are so much better off because it is in the public domain and because it's in remix. The fact, the saddest one is the fact that Dr. King's speech still requires some kind of financial transaction to be viewed. And it's like, that is itself an amazing remix of so many amazing works. And yes, yeah, sadly enough, here is one of the most important public speeches of the 20th century, and someone needs to be paid if you want to watch it. One of my favorite stories is the song Happy Birthday. Right, the lyrics. Yeah, currently yeah. in litigation with uh, Warner Music, uh, you know, uh, the, claiming they own the copyright to that. And, uh, I, you know, there was just a story about... Uh, a s online stream of a live event where they started singing happy birthday and the audio got shut down because wow. it was like, wow. sorry, that's a match. Worst birthday Owned party by. ever. <laughs> so anyhow, I want to leave time for questions from uh, this great audience uh, as well. So if folks have questions, I think there's a mic somewhere. Yeah, so that the, the video can uh, hear what you had to say. So. Thanks so much. I loved what you said about Y Combinator and the culture of like startup founders helping startup founders. And that's one of the things that I see so often on the internet. When we look at why the SOPA and PIPA stuff failed was because there was just a unified message and a unified front amongst the internet citizenry. 
how do we continue to take some of the biting commentary that comes out of people online when we, we forget that you know other people are people behind keyboards? Yeah. You know, how do we do that? How do we foster that spirit? I wish. Wait, you, you mean to say that unifying YouTube and G plus comments won't so won't solve it? Yeah. <laughs> no, it will inside, not. Inside I mean, joke. Inside that's, joke. That's the reality, right? Uh, I mean, Facebook's the closest thing we have to the you know the realest of identities, right? Real name, real photo, and people still behave like awful human beings to people they know in real life, right? <laughs> like they're willing. I mean, despicable stuff. So okay. So the reality is, I think no matter what some extent of, of awful people will feel comfortable saying things behind a device than they, more comfortable doing that than they would in person. No matter how much, real, you could put, you could, you could make it so their parents have to live stream, watch every comment they type, like they're still going, there's some, some subset they're gonna always do that. So on the one hand, there's the glib answer of like finding a way to like electrocute them whenever, I mean you guys, you could maybe plug that in Android somehow. Um, <laughs> but that's, the, the, I, unfortunately it is, there is a certain societal thing we can do for etiquette in terms of trying to encourage that better behavior. At some extent, nothing will be foolproof. There is the gift and a curse to an open communication platform is people are open, whether they're open to say things. Like, because remember, that same ability to say something that you would not feel comfortable saying to someone's face helps someone, right? When it, it helps someone say something, uh, if, they live, if they live in a community where they would be persecuted for their uh, sexuality, it gives them the confidence to say stuff that they couldn't say with their real name attached because they might be persecuted. Or they, they, that is a great gift, but the curse of it is, again, it lets some asshole abuse it. And I, you know, only Sith deal in absolutes, so I can't say, I, it, it, you have to take the good with the bad, and we need to do as much as we can to curtail the bad. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that's just gonna come from us as a society. I mean, so much of this has come up, and I think specifically of cyberbullying, and I think of Louis C.K.'s recent observation, which was so spot on, in which he said, like, the reason I don't let my daughters have cell phones or really use the internet much is because I need them to understand that when they are bullies, it hurts people. If you, if you bully someone to their face, it is a learning opportunity, and as a kid, usually, you, you, see, you feel empathy. You can't really help unless you're a total sociopath, but feel empathy. But when these kids come up, these whippersnappers, when these kids come up and can do it all from the safety of a phone, they never feel that empathy. And here's Louis C.K. on a late night show, and I'm like, damn, Louis, you've, that, you've nailed it. I don't have a solution yet, but it is, it is very clear that this is a risk that we run. And I, look, I don't know how, you guys are Google. You can figure it out probably faster than I can. Um, but it's a real issue because we don't know, this is all new territory. That's the other, I mean, that's the, the, the huge advantage, the best thing we have going for us right now is this is all a new frontier. And in a lot of ways, we, especially the people here at Google, um, have an opportunity to sort of guide that in some way, shape, or form, whether through the technology we build or the things we do. Um, but to some extent, you know, we also have to accept the fact that we can't totally control it. Yeah, I have, I have a question towards your history major. So you mentioned Jefferson. Yes. Any other uh, figures or maybe even trends historically or time periods, things like that, that have really influenced your career? Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Indeed. <laughs> Oh, man. I do not get asked this question. All right. Uh, I need to make my history professors proud. I, I mean, okay. The, uh, one interest, uh, man. One of the things that has really, intru well, okay. When I think of the future of m media, um, I am so, well, okay, actually, let's back this up. Tim Wu wrote an amazing book called The Master Switch. And it's basically, it's a great pairing with my book because he's like, this is, this is real talk from, from Professor Wu. He's just like, listen, all the same shit Alexis is saying about the internet, they were saying about radio, about film, about TV, about all these other communication platforms. And it was, it was gonna be so democratizing and so amazing and so wonderful. And every single one of them, every single one of them, whether it's through big business, big government, or some combination of the two, have been what they are today, which is anything but democratic. Uh, so I am very, very cognizant. I keep that book like floating in my head. Um, as, as optimistic as I am, there is a very real chance that this ends up going the same way of all those other platforms. And there's gonna be, you know, humans are resourceful, right? There's gonna be some other iteration of it, but I don't even wanna go down that road. Because right now we have such an opportunity, right? It is the world's largest library and the world's largest stage in one. And it's accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Which is part of the reason why I love you guys doing this balloon internet thing. Awesome. Like, 
access is still a huge part of it. And whenever people, there's some author who wrote a book that's saying Google was making us stupid. Can't remember who it was. Very, very link baity title. Yes, I don't mind as a history major not really remembering the world that Civil War was from 1861, 1865, even though it was, um, and having to Google that later. Because, yes, that is a cost, right? Maybe I'm a little dumber because I don't remember that particular fact because I know I can Google it or Bing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but again, the, the, that's the curse. The gift is anyone with an internet connection can now get the world's knowledge about the Civil War at their fingertips for nothing. My trade off, that's totally worth it. I will gladly be a little, bad, a little worse at trivia night if it means the world can get access to knowledge that's historically been only accessible to those who had the power or the money or the connections or the whatever. Um, so that's it. I mean, again, it's always a gift and a curse. There's always, I, I think generally speaking, uh, with any of these new technologies, it's always there. But that, that is the thing. And this one feels like it's going to be different. I know a lot of people in tech have gotten in trouble saying that. But I, I really hope so because it, it feels, in, in just the last five years, it feels like we are on the cusp of, of really doing something special and, and hopefully not following suit and following in the path of all those other technologies before it. Um, because that would suck. That would really, really suck. So let's not, let's not screw this up, people, OK? <laughs> hey, so uh, you said that your time at Y Combinator had a, a huge influence on your success. And, and you think that it's um, it's great opportunity for um, young people to get involved in the startup industry. If you look statistically at the type of people that are in Y Combinator, it tends to be overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly middle to upper middle class. Um, how do you suggest bringing that kind of opportunity to join the startup industry to people that have generally been disadvantaged, like minorities, uh, women, that kind of people? Well, so would, the only asterisk I'd put on that is uh, we actually I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but typically South and East Asians also do well at YC. But yes, over, like majority, definitely majority male and still. Um, this is, and this is an issue for Y Combinator. This is an issue for tech. And where does it begin? I mean, the, so the short answer is it is a reflection of, it is largely a reflection of the applicant pool to Y Combinator. So all right, how do we broaden that applicant pool? So part of that is, I mean, I hope, you know, I, I hope visiting 75 universities brings more people like, like a dose of what is possible. And I don't, at the end of the day, I don't care if they apply to Y Combinator. I just want them to get interested in building tech. Um, but this is not, this is such a big problem because the bias for tech investors is to invest in founders who aren't themselves technical. And so you are looking at fixing and correcting what has been a problem for a very long time. And so part of it is attacking at the earliest stages where it's like, you know, the reason I'm on the board or the advisory board of donors choose, and I'm actually fundraising for every STEM classroom in Brooklyn right now, um, is because, you know, it's getting access to technology in classrooms for kids at a very young age. It is increasing the number of uh, women and people of color who are doing STEM, who are, who, are, who are interested in computer science. There are amazing organizations that I support, like Black Girls Who Code, that are doing a great job, that are you know, single, that have single-minded focus on bringing women of color into technology and, and teaching them how to code. So there's, it is, there are so many elements to it. And I mean, I, from, the, from the tech community standpoint, there is also a kind of responsibility that we all have to create an environment and a place that is just welcoming. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, there, I, it, whether, whether it is conduct at hackathons, whether it is the kinds of events we run, whether it's the people we have on stage, whether it's all, I mean, it's all of this stuff. It's a ton of stuff. And I mean, I'm sure there's more that I could be doing. Um, but the low-hanging fruit that I've been able to find myself most effective with sort of breaks down to like whether it's, uh, again, whether it's supporting classrooms that don't choose, whether it's helping organizations that are specifically geared towards, uh, Girls Who Code is another great one, um, geared towards actually getting these valuable, valuable skills in the hands of the, the, the people who need it the most, um, as well as you know, just sort of generally trying to be an ally. Um, but it's not, not something that's going to unfortunately change overnight. But it is something that I, we, I, I can already see an improvement versus eight years ago when we were starting in tech. So it's not a reason to get complacent, 
but it's a reason to feel good about it. I mean, hell, even the last, I was so pla so pleased, the last Google science fair thing you guys do with all the high schools, I don't think there was a single dude a finalist. <laughs> and that's like awesome. Uh, sorry, guys. But, but like it's, it's things like that, that and, and stories and examples like that that I think we'll hope to show and, and work on this, but like it's, it's far from overnight, so. So it was kind of interesting. There was a, another talk just before yours, uh, and it's an editor from from The Economist who's writing a book on, uh, or the book is called The Writing on the Wall. Oh, and yeah. Kind of saying <laughs> that this n version of new media actually is kind of old media as well. Like, and how in the past, like in, in Romans especially, like they used to share information and transmission of it was relatively cheap because you had people that could transcribe it and copy it and send it around. And so he was actually like arguing the fact that kind of the establishment as it was before the internet is kind of the fad. And that this thing about being able to share information more freely is kind of, is the way things were done before the barriers to entry became so large that people couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's kind of like some hope for, like you're saying to be optimistic about, you know, that is where things are going. I, yes, and I actually bumped into him in Portland, actually, and I was able to get a signed copy of his book. Uh, so I'm a chapter in, and I know exactly what you're talking about, about ancient Rome. What's so cool is, yes, it is a, it, I think, and it's really easy to gush about how great the internet is. All of those things that have been so successful really are just, you know, better scaled versions of things humans have always done, whether it's, whether it's social media, whether it's, I mean, crowdfunding, right? Like, when we, as soon as we had currency, actually, pra people were bartering. They were probably like, hey, let's all pitch in to go create this thing, right? Like, th some of the best ideas are the ones that are just, you know, highly scaled versions of things human beings have always done instead of having to teach us a new skill. And, and, and on that same note, I'd encourage any of you who, uh, the next time you're going to complain about Reddit trolls or the quality of YouTube comments, there's a great uh, article online. I'm sure you can find it using your favorite search engine. Uh, about the graffiti in uh, oh. like Vesuvius. Oh, awful stuff on those walls. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It really is. Awful. It Naughty really is. Stuff. People are the same. Yeah. People are, it's, it's scale, but the people are still the same as they were then. So. Well, here's, and let me, because again, always very hopeful. One of the things that makes me so much happier is, so yes, people have always been the same. And, and we see that we can get all deep about like the duality of man and humans and the range of stuff. But look, I, I think historically we've always had forces that have always tried to, for whatever reasons, whether they were businesses trying to sell us more toothpaste, whether they were governments trying to make us scared, whether it was whatever, we have always been pushed towards sort of fearing our neighbor and being more afraid and being worried. And what I hope is, I really do believe, like most people are actually pretty decent, They're just decent people. And the fact that these stories, these sort of benign stories can now scale a lot further, when you can, you can read the story of some I don't know, some cute kids in an LA children's hospital putting up a sign that says send pizza. And that can go around the world and all of a sudden a bunch of random strangers are just buying pizza for a bunch of kids in a chemo ward. And that story now doesn't just stay within the family. I mean, that, I'm, sure, I'm sure at some point in the history of hospitals, someone did some random kind gesture like buy some pizza for some sick kids. But now that story scales. And now that story gets seen by more people and more people actually go, oh, you know what, that's, that's kind of nice. Like, that's cool. And we can, we can actually finally start scaling those subtle, kind gestures of humanity that never would have made headlines before, that never would have gone beyond our initial social circle. And I really hope, again, I am optimistic, but I really hope we get a little closer to all realizing we're all just carbon-based life forms trying to get by on the little blue dot. Uh, I mean, at least until the singularity. I know I saw Kurzweil earlier. Uh, <laughs> that's gonna be amazing. But until then, we gotta try not to fuck this thing up. They said in Star Trek, ugly bag of mostly water. <laughs> With all the revelations of what the NSA has been doing to spy on a bunch of people, I was kind of wondering. Oh, sorry. I was sort of like, is that God? What the, <laughs> uh, I was kind of wondering uh, what your thoughts on that were. Um, I know a lot of politicians are, they seem to be okay and in support of it. I can kind of guess what your thoughts are. Um, but two, also, how do you feel that the internet may change in response to this information? And also three, if there's anything you think we could do to prevent any bad outcomes that might come of it. For example, you hear about Brazil and China um, talking about decentralizing the internet. Yeah, oh man, all right. Well, NSA, uh, yeah. What is, what is creepy 
is in the like there's a brief dystopian section of the book where I'm like, here's what's gonna happen if we fuck this up. And I joke about everything the NSA has been doing for the last few years, which was awkward because I didn't want that to be prophetic. Um, that <laughs> is it is it is incredibly upsetting to me. And I think more and more Americans are realizing that i and maybe this is again wishful thinking, but we have a Fourth Amendment that protects our right to privacy in meat space, right? Our mail, our home, right? If you want to see it, great. It's due process. It's get a warrant. That should also apply to our digital email or our digital mail and our digital space. And I hope we can connect those dots for politicians so that they realize that that one, that boundary needs to exist. Absolutely, full stop. And then we can actually have an honest, open, public discussion about how much, right, it's all a trade-off between security and privacy. And last I checked, like this is ostensibly still a democracy where we're gonna have, we should have discussions about this. We, we should have, we, we should be able to publicly make decisions about just how much privacy we're willing to give up in the name of security. Uh, and so far, not only we haven't had those discussions at all, it's been a total cluster, right? We, we've it's violated all of our rights to privacy. And we are coming up on the 12 year anniversary of the Patriot Act in uh, a few weeks. And as a nation, we were really worried, really scared, and made some decisions that I think now 12 years later, now that we can all catch our breath and look at, we're not in the best interests of our rights as citizens. And I hope we can look back at those things now, now that we, I mean, that was a Republican president, George W. Bush, that uh, signed that into law, and then a Democrat who has upheld them. Um, and so every one of us, regardless of you know, our political stripes, I believe, is really starting to look critically at this. And I hope we get that line drawn, because we need it. Um, because we shouldn't have CEOs having to deal with these requests when they are not actually in you know, the spirit of the Constitution. So I am encouraged by the fact that humans are <laughs> always resourceful. Um, like I, every now and then I see the dark net thread bubble up where people are like, it's cool, we're gonna make our own internet again. It's good, like, they're, they're all, can, I, long term, I know humans are resourceful. It doesn't matter, right now, how much time and money and energy does the Chinese government spend trying to keep people from looking at photos of the Tiananmen Square massacre? And yet still, every day, people, thanks to Tor and other pieces of software, look at those things. Like, we are very resourceful. And, and that, in the end, gives me hope. I just don't want it to have to come to that. And so in the meantime, it's again, it comes back to us being active citizens and actually using this government that in theory represents us to not be stupid and, and actually have technologists in the room. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I've really enjoyed seeing your work on The Verge um, with you. Uh, small, empires. small empires. It's yeah. awesome. So I want to know uh, how that's going and where you're going with that. Um, so Small Empires is a show that I did on The Verge, or I do on The Verge, uh, to basically highlight New York tech. And not just show off the founders, because everyone gets to see founders. Show off people who work there, and more interestingly to me, people who use these platforms. Uh, and really kind of make, this is, I mean, it's in my way, it's like startup propaganda. I want people to watch it, be entertained, and think, holy shit, like, not only can I start one of these things, I could work there, and I could even use this thing. I'm a poet, and I can use rap genius to annotate my art. Um, that's an actual, actual example. Um, and also, of course, show off the New York tech scene. So we have part two of season one that just launched on Tuesday. It's going to continue through. We've got six episodes up now. The OkCupid okay one might be my favorite. It just went up. And it is the couple on that episode will make you feel so unromantic. You're gonna feel, you're gonna, every one of you is going to feel like you need to step up your romance game after seeing that episode. Mark my words. Uh, but what do I hope? I hope it scales. I hope we can get it on, I don't know, Netflix. So we can get it somewhere where a bunch of more people can even see it. And a lot of people have said, hey, come to Victoria and do a small empires here. Come to Orlando and do a small empires here. And you know what I said? I love traveling, but I cannot possibly do all that. I'm on a bus for the next five months. So one of the things we're trying to do, and I don't think it's been done before, is I'd like to uh, uh, open source the show or license out the show to some extent, kind of like how Ted does TEDx. I want someone to be like, hey listen, I want to run this show in Victoria, British Columbia, because we've got an amazing startup community here. We're building small empires. I want to show it off. And I'll be like, cool, here's what you need. Go forth and make awesome stuff. And like some basic branding guidelines. Here's how you shoot the episode. Like this isn't rocket science. We use it with, it's three cameras, four really talented people do all the real work, and I just sit there and talk to people. Like it can be run for pretty cheap. And I would love to see small empires sprout all over the world because, right, I want these ideas to spread. And I mean, I could, I could spend a lot of time on planes and go to a bunch of different communities all over the country, but like, I want to see small empires 
Nairobi from someone who actually loves Nairobi as much as I love New York. Because like, I mean, I can, I can love Nairobi, but not in the same way I love New York. And like, let's show, let's let locals show off <coughs> their communities that they're proud of, because uh, to hell with what I think. Hey, solutions that scale. Uh, it, we at Google, care a little bit about is Google, that. Is, is Google going to help me with uh, small empires? I'm from Orlando, so sign me up. There you go. Not there you go. The, 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 the dude showed up. All right. We'll have to, I'll, stay tuned, man. Small empires Orlando. And I was shocked, too. I was like, really? Orlando? And he was like, yeah, man. We're doing shit. It's not just Disney. Uh, yeah, I was kind of interested on uh, what technologies you think are going to continue help the growth of kind of like an open internet. Uh, I saw like the post by... Um, Shriner yesterday about like the Aaron Schwartz's uh, sh software finally shipped um, for like kind of a secure Dropbox, uh. Uh, and um, I, I used to work for iFixit, and they do a lot. They've been getting a lot of like all of their commentary with press now. Like the press is actually requiring that they use PGP on like all of their emails, wow. which is pretty wow. intense. Wow. Um, I mean, they're tech reporters, but you know, <coughs> uh, I figure that can spread. So I'm kind of curious. Like um, you know, PGP is old, but um, Secure drops new, and I'm kind of cu curious. Like in the next like five years, what do you think we need to? Uh, what kind of technology do we need to keep an open internet? Um, I mean, there's the darknet stuff, but beyond say, that, say the word yeah. Tor again. Say tor, the word tor, 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 <laughs> Tor. I, wow, this is. Here's what I love, right? The nature of innovation is I actually don't have a fucking clue. I don't know. Um, it it seems to me that yes, secure file storage. I mean, secure mail. I mean, this whole uh, uh, lava. Oh, geez. <laughs> Lava bit, yep. fiasco. Um, like there, there is clearly even from a business standpoint, I think there is going to be an increased demand in an actual secure messaging system. There's going to be increased demand for an actually secure storage system, and it sounds like we're, we're working towards getting that. Um, I, I would hate to see a sort of balkanization that comes out of the internet because of this. From like just even the standpoint of like, there are going to be people who are going to look twice at using a service. Let's say it's an American company whose servers are here in the States. Let's say. Let's say, <laughs> right? That's terrifying to me. Is it, if I'm putting on my businessman hat, I'm like, that's terrifying. We lead the world, essentially, in, in the internet economy, right? Like, every, the world is using Google. I'm generalizing here, but like, there are not a lot of industries left where the United States is, is, is sort of king of the roost. And that is not guaranteed. It, it, it is not guaranteed in any industry, but especially one that is as competitive and fast to grow as the internet, as online. And I worry that if we aren't building these things ourselves, someone else will. And before long, the next big thing pops up, and it's in Reykjavik, or it's in Berlin, or it's in, go down the list, where the laws are there that uphold the kind of privacy rights that I wish we had in the States. Um, well, that we ostensibly do have in the States, but aren't actually being enforced. So yeah, no, there are business opportunities here. And you guys are lots of smart people. I say, uh, I hope my book does not necessarily inspire you to go leave Google and start a company, because you guys have been such I was, wonderful I hosts. I was looking in here. I Why? seem to remember a line in here about, you know, the only people that go to Google are... <laughs> are waiting until they get the right idea to go start a startup. <laughs> That's what they are. Yeah. Good. Good. Are we Sure. I have to give a little background for this question, so I'll try not to take up too much time. Sure. But um, so early last year, I, uh, I was in college. I just graduated from Brown University. And someone I knew uh, named Sunil Tripathi oh, right. um, had disappeared. And no one knew if he had committed suicide. No one knew if he was kidnapped. Um, so you know, there was this, um, no one really had known what happened to him. So take a, a step like a couple months forward to April when the Boston Marathon bombings happened. So um, no one had found this missing student at Brown, um, and Reddit led this massive manhunt to uh, try. Oh, well, there was a massive manhunt around the country to find the the Boston Marathon bomber. There was chaos everywhere, and uh, Reddit had kind of formed this mob mentality, where uh, they thought that they, this missing student from Brown was one of the Boston Marathon bombers. And I, I was at the college at the time, so I, I saw like the real direct harm it was causing. His family was shattered. Um, I wasn't particularly close with him, but um, I knew his girlfriend. And she was just, just, I don't know, she was just completely stunned by the whole ordeal. So I guess, like, but this is the background for my question. Um, various forms of media have always had checks and balances uh, for free speech. Like print media, like you, like uh, libel is you can't um, print libelous information, right? So I guess how do you mitigate the power of 
the open free internet with its ability to do harm to people. Traditional media has gotten it wrong in the past. I mean, even after the Navy Yard shooting, CBS and NBC misidentified someone um, who was involved in the attack. So that, this is to say humans are themselves the problem, um, whether they are trained professional journalists or not. Um, there isn't, there is no good answer for this because, you know, yes, you know, it was not, there was a particular subreddit which had maybe a thousand people using it that was responding to an FBI request to help track the Boston bombers and they misidentified someone. If, you know, the New York Times did a very thorough investigation in the Sunday magazine about what happened and it turned out that a journalist had tweeted that Reddit post, a journalist, professional journalist, had tweeted it out. Um, and then it got retweeted, even Perez Hilton joined in, and that spun it out of control. So there are lots of humans responsible for this. And at the end of the day, there isn't, there is not, there just is not an easy answer for this. Because what, you know, if one journalist draws attention to a random Reddit thread and it gets picked up and the New York Post decides to put it on their front page, how, you know, how after the fact can we actually say what, what we can do? I mean, the, the, and this goes back to being the gift and the curse of the open platform. Like, there's, oh, sure. Um, it's an awful, awful thing that happened. And unfortunately, it's, there, there's no easy solution for the next time. I mean, if, even if you told, I mean, every one of those trained journalists, even the one who retweeted that Reddit thread, um, it makes, they make mistakes. And now we've given an opportunity for anyone with a connection to have a soapbox, and they're going to make mistakes. And so, you know, in response, Reddit has sort of to the best of its ability now in, sort of said no more of these kinds of witch hunts. No, you can't create a subreddit to try to identify the Navy Yard shooter or any other person who the FBI or someone wants to track down. Um, but the reality is they'll, they're just doing it on Twitter, right? That's what happened during the Navy Yard shooting. They just do it all on Twitter. And people are unfortunately, uh, as they have always been, capable of being, even when they have the best of intentions, being wrong. And it's a it is a challenge that will always exist as long as we have people. And once we have sentient robots, they'll just enslave us. So I, like, I don't know. There's no, yeah, yeah. There, there's no easy answer. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the response that Reddit took. Um, but I just know that in a world with social media, this is, whether it's a journalist or Joe Sixpack, it's, it's probably going to happen again. Okay, well, I wanted to say thanks. Thanks a bunch for coming. And uh, once again, plug the book, go read it. It's available right over there. And uh, thank you, Alexis, for joining us.